Okay, we're coming back together here. Thanks for bearing with us as we switch things up just a little. I appreciate your patience and um, your ability to shift on the fly, and I appreciate that of our speakers as well. And speaking of speakers who are able to shift on the fly, I'd like to introduce John Twitchell, who is our area supervisor for the Colorado State Forest Service. John has been working with wildfire and forest management for his entire career, which spans longer than we will talk about because he looks much younger than he really is. So John's going to talk to us about how to prepare our home, he talk to us about how to prepare ourselves, our families, our animals. Um, John's going to talk to us about preparing our homes, which of course then leads into how our neighborhoods and communities are prepared. So John, why don't you go over to you. Okay, thanks, Todd. Yeah, so we got off schedule a little bit. We have so many good things we want to tell you about, and this this is bound to happen. And I know we've been talking at you for a while, but we really do want some interaction. So if it seems like I'm rushing through this program, it's because I'm rushing through this program. But you have HIZ, the Home Ignition Zone, uh, a document in there, and I want to I want to emphasize a few points on that. And then what we're going to do, we still want to do this root exercise. So we really want to start with a, a community sheet and the three things you can do. You could, originally we were going to have these separate breakouts and have you go through that uh, checklist for the home ignition zone, which we sort of customized one for you. And there's one in the document. But I think what I'm going to try to do is get through this very quickly and then just have you talk and just talk about your sense of preparedness. You've heard some things here today, and um, you know, there's a saying in fire, or there used to be, uh, that you, you got to be like Gumby. And uh, there's probably some young people who don't know what I'm saying when I say Gumby, but on fire, you got to be Gumby, which means you got to be flexible, and that's what we're doing here today. So I appreciate it. Um, I was going to, my program, I got some notes here and I was going to tell you about all, all this stuff that uh, has been happening, but you heard a lot about that. We have a lot of fires uh, in the area. I mean, yeah, I'll quickly tell you. Um, you know, in, in 2021, you know, we had uh, 7.1 million acres burned. That's a lot. Um, in 2020, uh, uh, we had uh, you know, 10 million. Um, and, and so I, I won't read the whole list, but just to give you some perspective, and I, this is a little fun fact I found out uh, with the Route National Forest was doing some history looking up things. And, uh, you know, between 1909 and 1940, in the Route National Forest, the average acres burned was 66 acres a year. So things have changed. I, I just wanted to throw that little fun fact in. I'm going to talk to you about. Home ignition zone. If there's one thing in this in, in the document, there's some links and websites. If there's one name, one thing you come to remember from what I talked about this morning, think Jack Cohen. And um, Jack is not the only person who worked on this. There were a lot of people and a lot of experience went into this. But if you Google, and then we all have a wonderful internet, Google Jack Cohen. There's some wonderful videos, and he's also a really good presenter. He's a lot better than I am. If you see those videos, and sometimes there's one that's like, there's one on that thing, it's like 13 minutes. It, it's the best 13 minutes you can spend. It really drives home what we're going to talk about very quickly. Um, so, this is the mission of Colorado State Foresters, uh, which I'm obligated to tell you. Um, but we, we're here to, to work on private. State and federal men are all across the board to achieve stewardship of our forest lands. Um, fire overview fundamentals, we can skip that, but we're very quickly uh, the fire triangle, which involves fuel, heat, oxygen, um, and fire behavior triangle, which you may or may not be as familiar, um, involves topography, weather, and fuel. And if you notice, there's one thing in common between those two triangles, and that's fuel. And it's the one thing we can actually do something about. Uh, and, and that's one of the other messages I want you to, to realize. You've heard a lot of kind of grim news. It was grim to me, too. I was like, ooh. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some scary stuff. But 
Uh, I am here to tell you we can do something about it. We're not helpless. Um, and and there's things you can do that really could make a big difference um, when it comes down to it. Uh, so let's see. So uh, fields are, are anything that can burn, essentially. Um, and, and then you know, those are, are essential to managing fires. A lot of what fire is is separating a lot of fire management, a lot of what Kevin and Mike and all the firefighters in here do is they try to separate that fire, that, that, that chemical process that's going on from the fuel. Um, and, and we can do a little of that before the fire starts. And that's sort of the message here. Oh, uh, by the way, houses are fuel. And that's a point that's been driven home kind of recently, but uh, we saw that in paradise and we've seen that in uh, a more recent fire here in Marshall. Um, so uh, we heard and Pam said, um, you know, Anders, that's one, that's if there's one thing Jack Coleman really came up with is it's like, hey, these embers make a huge difference. Embers in this low, what he calls surface fire, but it's low intensity fire. So I didn't really talk too much about me, but I did spend over 20 years as a well, and firefighter. I volunteered for North Carolina, but I also went out a lot on the state. And to date myself, I was on the Bobcat Fire. Remember that? But, uh, but I was also on the Hayman. And, and I was, uh, um, very quickly, I was on an engine crew on the Hayman. And a group of engines that were working the, the fire at night, going to houses. And, and, and so this really resonates with me because what I saw is houses that you go, well, how come that house burned? And you know, I did my own little Jack Cullen thing. And, and he was working on this at that time. And it was any place you had contiguous wood to the house. So it wasn't that, you know, that, that Hayman fire, you know, the channel four and nine years, you know, 200 foot flame lights was very impressive. That's not a burn of houses. Everyone was evacuated. We were in there at night. There were a small number of engines and thousands of homes and little dancing little flames just everywhere is what burned houses. So therefore, saving a house can be as easy as doing just some common sense things. So yes, adjacent ground fires uh, can ignite the radiant heat, but it's got to be pretty close, and it's got to burn for a while. Um, and that's the other thing, Jack Cohen. You know, they did the experiments, and they, they had a tree burning next to a sheet of plywood. And as soon as the tree flamed out and stopped burning, as long as that the period of time was short enough, then, then the flame was not sustained and the fire went up. So it's the little things that make a huge difference here is the message. So that's where we came up with this home emission zone. I spent a large part of my career talking about defensible space. And home emission zone incorporates defensible space. It doesn't say it's not important. But what we really found is it's really important. What you do at your home and five feet away from your home, those are critical areas. Um, and so the two primary determinants of home ignition, as you can see there, is structural ignitability and the defensible space. And we're going to emphasize that structural ignitability. Um, and so again, Jack Cole, remember that name? Uh, and he did a bunch of really cool experiments, and I'm not going to get into it, but if you watch the video, it's pretty cool. He had to do a lot of them in Canada because uh, it, it was harder to light large blocks of logical pine in the United States getting all the permits and everything. So we went to Canada to do some of this very impressive stuff. So, defensible space, most of you have probably heard about that. That's it. And you have these zones that emanate from the house. It all starts at the house, and it all really starts with you and your personal responsibility. Then it goes out into the what we used to call a back forty, and that's where Kevin and myself and other forestry we work on. I'm trying to keep that that flame front away, but right around the house is pretty key, and so that's defensible space, structural accountability. Um, you know, there's some metal siding, which I'm seeing a lot of. I have some of that in my own house. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, so we're talking about hardening your home to fire. That doesn't mean you have to live in a cinder block house. 
with a metal river through no windows, but it but it does mean we've got to fix some common sense um, uh, things to do. So we've got uh, you know classic uh, fire rating, which is just um, it's not necessarily fireproof, but it, it, it has a long it's got to have a lot of heat on it for a long time before it, it starts burning. Um, these are all simple things you can do. Removing the leaves and needles uh, uh, from the gutter, which is a constant project if you've got trees around your house. Um, screening, uh, if you do have an, a vented attic or you have other areas, uh, even under your deck, um, use at least, you know, use a small screen, not quarter inch, but eighth inch, um, to stop those embers. Ember showers are usually kind of short, you know, maybe a couple minutes, a minute, although you could have a fire brand come and, and, and um, you know, we're finding in some of these cases, like we heard about these troubles, so many fire brands are floating in front of the fire for half a mile, a mile, even more. Um, uh, so, screening, pepper glass uh, is good, but it's expensive. Uh, but double paint is good. And you know, glass, even a single painting absorbs 70% of the heat of a fire. So, so yes, you know, if you got time, take the curtains and move the furniture, but that's not that critical. At the point your window fails, um, there are you know, other problems. Um, uh, so it's it's not, it, it, yeah, I was, uh, there are better things to spend your time on in the last, Few minutes at your home as you're getting ready to leave. Um, and so these are pretty, I'm not going to read them all. You can all read it. And you have this excellent document um, to read. And it really does reflect the latest science we know. And the science is changing. But we really found that embers and the little fires, and they've been caused by embers, or may just be residual from the flame front, but there's nobody there. You could put it out in your garden hose if you were there, but you were evacuated. Properly. So um, again, uh, this is I think Jack Cohen saying if it doesn't ignite, it doesn't burn. That's common sense to think about it because that's and that's why we, we when I had a question about the firewood. You know, the firewood's there on your, your wooden porch, right? So what's the difference? Well, the difference is with firewood, it, it's a good receptor for those members. And you know, they kind of get sucked in your thing of firewood, and then you don't see it. But the question I was asked, well, what if I put it in a fireproof container? It's like, yeah, sure. You know, once you, if you want to bring it in your living room, once it's part of the house, at the point that that firewood burns, you've got other problems. You've lost that structure already. So you can do things like that. Um, but leaving your unattended firewood. Uh, pile next to the house, or within 30 feet of the house, or on your deck, and just leaving it that way um, is not an idea. Like mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so what he's doing is stone, and thank you for that. That's a great prompt because here's a, like, a really easy thing that I see all the time. And it occurred to me when we were doing this that, that we should be talking about landscape because. I see a lot of homes with colored mulch right up against the house. Mike knows what I'm talking about. And um, that's the first thing I zero in on. It's like, hey, you did so many things right, but you left this mulch here. It's a perfect, it's like paper. It's like crumpled up newspaper. And, and an ember that lands on that mulch is going to produce a little heat. And that's all it takes. Again, that's the lesson that, that I think my experience, plus what Jack Cohen and the research says is, it doesn't take much to burn your house down, but it doesn't take much to keep it from burning down either. So that's a great question. So it's that, if you get into the zones, it's really that five feet away um, that we want to uh, emphasize. This is 100 feet away. This is the deep space um, where we want to reduce the number of trees, separate the crowns, and not going to get in all that spacing. But listen, I haven't done this for, for a lot of years. And walk on with landowners, and they, you know, sometimes it feels like a negotiation. And, you know, it's like, wow, I don't want to take that tree. And it's like, well, no, you know, just understand, understand what your risk tolerance is. Um, but you don't have to clear cut. That's a message sometimes the insurance companies are like, 
You know, they could have got 100 feet away. But a tree burning, I don't care how big it is, 100 feet away from the house does not produce enough radiant heat to burn the house down. I can put some embers out, and those embers could burn your house down. But the radiant heat from trees goes, goes pretty quickly if you've seen a tree flare up. So, um, but the other thing is, as I said, reducing those trees, and sometimes you know, like, oh, there's two trees, they're so close together, it's like, well, consider one tree and leave the two there. So, there's a little art with the science here, but the basic premise is you don't want fire stripping from tree to tree and then to your house, and you don't want the heat of that tree as it flares up, you know, that, that fir tree that turned red last year in your yard, that's a good one to get rid of. Because it's like it, it, you could light it with a big lighter. Um, speaking from experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's not a species of tree. And then the other thing is, as a firefighter, and, and you know, I, I used to, when I was doing more of it, you know, it's like, well, is that tough to you know, make a decision about going in and saving the house? It's like, no, it's not tough at all. I got to save myself first as a firefighter. I was my number one, and always just generally in any fire plan, it is the number one thing. You know, you're not going to do any good if you put yourself um, in, a, in, a, in a bad situation. It's risky enough out there. Don't go in. And, and so that's your drive in. Think about that. Your access to you guys have heard about that. Yeah, you can reach out on my house, but I can't get to it because I'm not going to drive through that flaming forest. But if I feel like I look in there and I say, hey, I, well, first I can see it. That helps. Secondly, I can, I can see that there's been a lot of work done. So, so oftentimes, um, you only have a few minutes as a, a firefighter um, in, in those situations. And particularly in the neighborhood, just keep in perspective. We talked about lack of resources. It isn't even on a big fire, like the Marshall Fire, there's a thousand fires or a thousand homes lost. Um, you didn't have a thousand trucks out there, uh, particularly in that first 24 hours, you're talking maybe dozens. So you have to make some hard decisions, and act, as I say, it's not all that hard. Um, so again, we, we want to um, make it safe for ourselves. Um, we're separating and reducing fuels to keep that fire spread. So here it's, here's the heart of the uh, HIC. It's that one to five foot, really. I'm not saying, you know, once you get beyond five feet, of course, those things, bad things can happen, but it's that five feet. And that's easy. And we can do that this afternoon. I know you want to hear this. It's a beautiful day out here. Um, you could go home and, and, and think about that. In colored rock, there's all sorts of things you can use other than mulch. And, and we do have to get to the landscapers and get them to think about that. Um, so and it's a linkage between the structure and the rest of the property. Again, fire can follow a wooden fence. It does. You know, like when I get yeah, on the hammer car, I was amazed. I was looking at the house. Like, How did that house burn down? And we had some time, which you sometimes have on fire. And it's not going and blowing. And we looked at it. I was like, oh, it followed the landscape. Like, that was the only thing that it, it burned. It came from the flaming front. And when 50 feet up the landscape, they were back to the front porch, and then it was, you know, it was, it was too late. So, um, zone two, uh, again, now we're moving further out into that 30 foot zone, and I would say that's your next, absolutely your next critical zone. That's where you've got to make those hard decisions about trees. I made them myself, you know, I love trees, um, but uh, believe me, sometimes if you you know, you take a few of those trees, within a week, you'll forget that they were there. Um, maybe not, but, um, but, but you, got, you know, these are the hard decisions you make, and you make, you're personally responsible for this. That's one thing we heard, it's like, well, my own one, you know, we're paying on emphasize, I know I emphasize it again. Don't wait, use your common sense. If there's a large black cloud that's moving in your direction, you do not need reverse 911. It may not be working, you may not get that call or that text. Use, be responsible for yourself and your family and, and go. Sam said that second thing, I want to emphasize that. Uh, separate shelf pumps, uh, eliminate matter fuels, um, and keep your grass mode. Um, so, uh, and then we get into zone three. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, essentially, if you look at this, uh, there's a house that survived a fire. 
Um, and, and there are some trees near the house, by the way. Uh, one of the interesting things, and I think we really brought it home with um, uh, uh, the campfire and, and uh, paradise was you look at some of the pictures of, of homes that burned. Um, the trees, um, <laughs> the trees were actually green on the side facing the house. So, um, and all that says is the tree didn't catch the house on fire. The house might have caught the tree on fire, but it was amber showers. If you remember some of the dramatic videos from that fire at night, in particular, you can see that at night there was a steady stream of uh, uh, embers. And that's what happens when the houses burn. They become a fuel, by the way. So it's, it, it changes. It's not a forest fire anymore. Kevin can speak to that more than I can. But it's a fuel and it burns and it jumps to the next house. And it's, so even if you've got 50 feet between the house or 100 feet, and so the radiant heat isn't doing it, the embers can. Um, so where to begin? Well, there's a lot of places you can begin, and that's why we're, we're, we're going to work through this, because you can look at this when you're thinking about the three things you might do, but um, you start at your house and clean your guts, and do that periodically. Um, and, and we're not going to do this, so we'll just blow by that. Um, and the recap, um, again, surface scattered, you know, you know, pretty obvious stuff, the broom, the furniture on your on your deck, first thing of fire, forest fire. I'm sorry, a wild thing a firefighter does when he pulls up to your house and runs out onto your deck and starts throwing your furniture off it, or at least the cushions off it. Um, Save him that trouble and do it before. Uh, the screens we talked about, again, eighth inch or fan. It does reduce the, the airflow, but it keeps the embers from getting in the attic. Um, and then everyone, we all like to store stuff below our deck. I'm guilty. Um, but that's a good place for embers to catch and then catch the house on the water. And then again, prioritize that one. Um, and it doesn't end. And this is constant. So if you did it last year, you have to do it again. And that's it. Now I know I'm going to do that. But I hope I emphasize a couple points. I'll just go back over those again. What you do right around that house, what your house is made of to start with. We, you know, we, in North Rally, a lot of metal roofs, that's a class A type of roof. Most um, shingles these days, unless you have wood shakes, most um, of your uh, shingles will be class A. Uh, make sure they are. Um, and, then, and then just start, take that checklist and walk around. Again, uh, sometimes it may cause some family. Uh, disruption when you start talking about um, that five foot area because that's pretty important, right? That's my shrub. My mother gave me that shrub. It's a drum since she gave it to me. But, and that's hard. But again, we, we live in a place, uh, and I live in North Route. Um, and uh, so, you know, last couple of summers we've seen the fires and, and uh, uh, one of these days, I would have been on pre back. And I'm just, you know, on the fire. And my wife's like, well, what are we going to do? And it's like, oh, where's my ready set go sheet? You know, I, I'm better prepared than that. But, but the, the reality is, how the shoes there, but um, the reality is, um, we really do need to take to heart that uh, saying that it's, it's not, it's not when it's if. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not if it's when. <laughs> Um, it's going to happen. Our forests are fine to burn. They're at least 100 to 150 years old. A lot of them are in bad shape. Um, some of that's normal turnover with logical. We're going to see more fire. But not to be an alarmist, this is reality. If you could do so much with your house and, um, and look at that, I'm going to leave you with this. Look at that picture in the HIZ and there's a house. Um, I can't remember which fire that was from. Uh, um, but there's a house there. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that one, is, I believe, is Grand County, but um, that's not. And so your house can survive. Harden that house, harden that area around it. And that's stuff you can do. And literally, you could start it today. Um, and that's my message. I don't know if we've got time for questions or where we're at. We want to have the workshop. We are, yeah, let's go into the workshop. And then if you have questions, we've got facilitators. 
And, and use this workshop again to, I would say, more focused on, on what Pam spoke about. What can you do? What can you do as a group of people? But look at that checklist and, and let us know if there's obstacles to getting that done. Pam, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, that's an instruction. Oh, good. 